Previously, I defined an ionic compound as being two or more ions combined together in a fixed ratio. I want to give that definition a little bit more detail. An ionic compound is specifically a cation, one type of cation, combined with one type of anion, again, in a fixed ratio. In this video, I'm gonna teach you how to name ionic compounds. So we have these three formulas here and we're gonna turn them all into names. I'm also gonna teach you how to look at the name of an ionic compound and turn that name into a formula. Before we get started on that, I wanna let you know that there's sort of this standard uh, rule, uh, un unwritten rule, that we always name the cation first and the anion second when we are naming ionic compounds or writing their formulas. So whether we're writing a formula or writing the name with words, the cation is always first in the name and the anion is always coming second in the name. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to, over here on the side, I'm gonna write out the steps that you will take when you are naming an ionic compound. And these steps are going to help us also when we are converting a name into a formula. So when we're naming an ionic compound, we're basically just going to look at the two types of ions, the cation and the anion, individually. And because the formula starts, always starts with the cation, that's the first thing that we're going to focus on. In order to name the cation, we have to ask ourselves some questions about the cation. We really just need to um, locate where, where it is on the periodic table. So is the cation located in group 1A or 2A on the periodic table by the new numbering system, that would be group 1 or group 2. So is the cation in one of those groups or is it the silver cation Ag+, the zinc cation Zn2+, the aluminum cation Al3+, or the cadmium cation Cd2+. So initially all we're doing is looking at our cation and trying to figure out if it is meeting this criteria, one of these, one of these six different types of things. And if it is, if the answer is yes, then all that we have to do is name the metal. Based on um, the name of the corresponding atom. So before we move on, let's actually apply this first step to our first example over here. We're gonna look at this guy right here. Remember that the cation is always first, so we're focusing on the cation, and we're asking ourselves, is that cation coming from group 1A or 2A or one of these four things? Well, obviously it's not one of these four things, so really what we need to figure out is, is it in group 1A or 2A on the periodic table? Let's go take a look at the periodic table. Calcium is located right here. And that is in group 2A. So the answer to this question is a yes. And that simply means that we just need to name the metal, which is calcium. Now I wanna add here, um, if you're still struggling to relate the names of the atoms with their atomic symbols, that's pretty normal. Just find a good resource that gives you a list of the atomic symbols next to the atoms names and just kind of keep that handy so that you have that as a good resource while you're getting these things learned. I don't want you to put any effort into like actively trying to memorize these symbols and names because it really isn't a good use of your time. Okay, so we've got this first step covered for this first ionic compound. Obviously there are gonna be some situations where the answer to this question is no, but I wanna hold off on letting you know what to do in that situation because I wanna just go ahead and finish this one out first. So leave yourself some space if you're taking notes because we're gonna put some information in here about what to do if the answer is no, and we'll move on to step two. And step two just tells us to name the anion. So when we're naming the anion, we don't have to try to figure out anything about that anion, like where it might be located on the periodic table. We just name the anion. The anions are typically going to be nonmetals from the periodic table. And we've talked about this before, that if we have a nonmetal anion, 
Its name resembles the name of the atom, the corresponding atom, but its ending is always eyed. So, uh, for example, I'm looking for examples that we don't have on here. This ion, N3 minus, this is an anion. This would be the nitrogen atom, but because it's an anion, we call this nitride. Or uh, Br minus, this is an anion. The atom, Br, is called bromine, but as an anion, we call this bromide. And we'll be able to look at a few more examples of changing the ending when we're doing these um, practice problems over here. So let's go back to our CAF2. We're now ready to name the anion. This F is fluorine as an atom, but as an ion, we need to change its ending. So it is fluoride, calcium fluoride. And that is the entire name for this ionic compound. I want to point a couple of things out. First of all, this is two separate words. So there is a space in between calcium and fluoride. It's not all jammed together. And also, secondly, it is conventional to not capitalize calcium fluoride unless it's like the beginning of a sentence and you would capitalize it just grammatically anyways. So these names are not proper names in the English language and they do not get capitalized. They're lowercase. Also, uh, in case you're wondering, we don't do anything with the quantity of fluoride in, in the name. So there's nowhere in this name that we are communicating that we actually have two fluorides. So let's move on to our next example, NIO, and let's go back to our steps that we have here. First thing we have to do is analyze the cation. Is it in group 1A, 2A, or one of these four? It's not one of these four, so now we need to go find it on the periodic table. Specifically, we're just looking to see if it's in group 1A or 2A. Nickel in I is located right here, which is not in group 1A or 2A. So that means that we cannot answer yes to this question and we have to think about what happens when the answer is no. When the answer to this question is no, we are still going to name the metal, but we also have to add the charge of the metal. We're gonna do that using Roman numerals. So we're gonna use Roman numerals to indicate the charge. So I've got to give you a little bit of side information. All of the metals that are not in group 1A or 2A or one of these four, like nickel, for example, they are all capable of forming cation, a few different types of cations. So maybe a plus one cation sometimes, it might be a plus three cation other times. And because the charge on these cations varies, we have to indicate the charge in the name using Roman numerals. So finally, an opportunity for you to use the Roman numerals that you learned in elementary school. So that means over here for this, because we have one of these um, cations that is not in group 1A or 2A, we are going to have to indicate the charge of that cation in the, in the ionic compound's name. First, we will just give it its actual name, which is nickel. And then in parentheses, immediately following nickel, in this area right here, we're going to write the charge of the nickel cation using Roman numerals. So if the charge is one, then we'll use Roman numeral one. If the charge is two, we'll use Roman numeral two, etc. You get the idea. How do we know what the charge is on this guy? Nickel is in the area of the periodic table where I've told you we cannot predict the charges on these ions. Like we can predict that these are all plus ones and these are all plus twos and these are all plus threes. So how could we figure out the charge on nickel? Well, in order to figure out nickel's charge, we're actually gonna look at its buddy, oxygen. In this particular compound, nickel is paired up with oxygen. And oxygen is one of the compounds that forms a predictable charge. Oxygen is always a minus two ion. So we know, I'm gonna make a little note over here, we know that the anion is definitely a minus two charge. That's the only option for nickel. 
Because ionic compounds always come together to form a charge neutral product, we know that the charge on this nickel must be a plus two. Let me say that one more time. When the anions and the cations come together, they always form a compound that is overall charge neutral. So if we know that we have a minus two anion, we must have a plus two cation in order for this to be neutral. Since we know that nickel is a plus two, we can go ahead and indicate its charge in Roman numerals in this parentheses. And now we have finished step one and we're ready to move on to step two. We have the oxygen atom here as an ion. We're gonna call this oxide. Oops, no, no parentheses there. So again, with the name, this is two separate words. We do have a space between them. There is no space between nickel and the parentheses for the Roman numeral. So those two are jammed up together like this is all one word with a space and then the second word. And let's check out our next example. So um, starting with the cation, is it in group 1A or 2A? Because it's definitely not one of these four. Let's go to the periodic table and we'll find it. Li, which is located right here in group 1A. Because it is in group 1A, we just simply have to name that metal, lithium. We do not have to indicate its charge. Now you might be wondering, um, why don't we have to say the charge on these? Why is that not necessary? And I did mention this, that is because everything in group 1A and group 2A always forms a predictable charge. So when we say lithium, we know for sure that it's plus one. When we say calcium, we know for sure that it is plus two. Nickel and all of these other elements here, because of their location, we have no idea what their charge might be, which is why it has to be included in the name. So we have lithium, now we're ready to name the anion. Um, this is, H stands for hydrogen. As an anion, this is hydride. So there are three examples of converting the formula into the name. Let's go in the other direction now. Now we have some names and we're gonna turn these names into molecular formulas. We know that the cation is always listed first. So that means that this tin four is indicating that we have a tin cation, I'm gonna write underneath here. And it's actually really easy when we have Roman numerals showing because we don't even have to take the time to think about what the charge might be. We know from the Roman numeral four that that means that the charge on this cation is a plus four. And the symbol for tin is SN. So we have the tin plus four cations. And what about our anion? So our anion is sulfur, which is the anion of sulfide, or, uh, anion called sulfide. Where is that located on the periodic table? Sulfur is right here. And I'm just actually going to write these charges down. Plus one, plus two, plus three, no charges. So Na minus three, minus two, minus one, no charges over here. Sulfur located in this column has always a minus two charge. So let's write that down. Oops. How would these ions come together to form an ionic compound? What would we write? Remember I taught you this crisscross rule where the charge of one is the quantity of the other. So if we follow that rule, tin, the, qu the quantity of tin is the charge on the sulfur, so SN2 and the quantity of the sulfur is the charge on the tin. So again, that's just taking the charge of one and making it the quantity of the other. And then once we get that figured out, we have to simplify it. In this case, we definitely have to simplify SNS2. So we're just reducing that ratio down. So that's actually pretty easy. That's not too hard to do. Let's take a look at our next example, potassium oxide. When we don't see any Roman numerals, that means that these Ions are located in columns that have predictable charges. So let's go find them. Potassium is right here, always a plus one. Oxide is right here, always a minus two. Let's make a note of that. Potassium, always a plus one, and oxide, always a minus two. And then we'll use our crisscross rule. The charge of one is the quantity of the other. So that means we need K2O. Again, the charge on the oxygen is the quantity of the potassium, and the charge on the potassium is the quantity of the oxygen. And as you know, we don't write the one, it's just implied. We have one more example, 
cobalt, which is CO. And we can see from Roman numerals that that's a plus three ion. So it's very easy. We don't have to look for it. And then chloride, which we go find that on the periodic table. Chloride is right here, and it is always a minus one ion. So cobalt and chloride, which is a minus one, use our crisscross rule. The charge of one is the quantity of the other. Cobalt, Cl3. Again, the charge of the chlorine is the quantity of the cobalt, and the charge of the cobalt is the quantity of the chlorine.